dominated by food deception. That is, they mimic food that the uh, pollinator uh, would like to eat. Of course, there's no food there. And as is typically the case, if you uh, compare the behavior of those that are getting an actual reward versus those that are getting a pseudo reward, the, the species where they get a pseudo reward, the male spends very little time. You know. He gets he, he's sexually excited and he, he almost wants to, but now nah, this ain't the real thing and he's on somewhere else. Okay, so that's how he solved that problem. Now, the problem of sterile ants initially looks a little bit that way, but that wasn't quite what bothered Darwin. In other words, there you have a, a female ant not reproducing herself, but working for someone else. But most of the time she's working for her mother. And the genetic problem bothered him a bit more. How did genetic change take place so that, such that the workers could evolve all these different uh, traits after they went sterile. As I say, he did not know genetics, so he just said selection acts at the family level. And we know that's a, just an approximation, but it was good enough for the situation at hand. Incidentally, his own theory of genetics had to do with gemmules, which were sent by all of the organs down to the gonads and then transmitted during sex. Now, Peter was kind enough not to mention that I threw away 15 years of my life with another man writing a book on all cases of internal genetic conflict where the genes in you are fighting. But imagine that the genetic system was the way Darwin imagined. The closer you got to the gonads, the more fighting there would be between these gemmules to get into the gonads. It would be painful. Now let me act out the male first, if you forgive me. You come up to a female, you think you want to have sex. There's an excruciating pain down here, and the closer you get to the sexual act, the worse it is. All right, let me be a female. So now it's the ovaries back here, and you know, in principle, she'd like to have sex, but she's got this pain in her back. Anyway, that's, that's a side comment on uh, his genetic theory, which did not pan out. Now, let's turn to the peacock's tail. So I've already mentioned what the problem with a the peacock's tail there was. Um, how could you explain it in terms of survival? And he realized, ah, it's not that, it's what he then called sexual selection, which most of us now would just put underneath natural selection as an example of natural selection, a subcategory. But for him, it was competition within one sex for access to members of the opposite sex, and it was intersexual choice. And what that boiled down to was male-male competition and female choice. And he was sure via comparative evidence that female powers of discrimination, female choice, had to be a strong force in nature. That was, yes, baby. That was not a popular view at the time. Indeed, it was believed in Victorian England that it was the male that had the advanced aesthetic sense. You know, wasn't Rembrandt a male? I don't know how the argument ran. Um, but Darwin knew from comparative study of birds, for example, that females had to be the discriminating ones. He almost solved the entire problem and would have wiped out one of my papers because he also knew that males typically did not do much inv investment, if any, in the offspring. They just supplied the sperm. All the work was done by the female. But he didn't put the two sets of facts together. They're in his book, sexual selection, the descent of man, but he didn't quite reach there. Um, later on, when the geneticists rediscovered Mendel and were feeling their oats right, right around the turn of the 20th century, they ridiculed two aspects of Darwin that I've just mentioned, female choice and mimicry. They said, if you'll just remove these absurdities from the theory, we'll pay attention to the theory but they weren't absurdities. Now, 
the, or, uh, the, sorry, the sexual selection of the of man is a big fat book, and I read it once upon a time, and I was not about to read it again for this talk. So I decided I'll just read it like some people read the Bible. You know, you just flip it open to a page, and you look down, and whatever your eye hits, that's what God or Charles wants you to know that day. So here we are. And literally, I didn't have to flip it a second time. I flipped it once, and my eye went to this, something I had completely forgotten. <coughs> Various facts which I have, I'm quoting him now. Various facts which I have elsewhere given prove that the color of the skin and hair is sometimes correlated in a surprising manner with a complete immunity from the action of certain vegetable poisons and from the attacks of certain parasites. He's saying dark skin tends to protect you from parasites. Hence it occurred to me that Negroes and other dark races might have acquired their dark tints by the darker individuals escaping during a long series of generations from the deadly influence of the miasmas, the diseases, of their native countries. I said, Abba, bus is dust. Because for 40 years, I have paid attention to the literature on skin color out of a general interest and perhaps out of a personal interest as well. And for 30, whatever it was, five of those years, having forgotten Darwin, if I ever read that sentence, I followed the usual view that dark skin protects you from the sun which it does. Darker skinned people have less uh, malignant melanoma. And that in turn, very light skin is helpful to manufacture vitamin D up in really northern climates where you don't get much sunlight and may not have another source of vitamin D. And then Anders Muller, the brilliant Danish ornithologist, uh, in 2003, said, no, 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 that cannot be the only explanation. Here's a paper. And it was all about the biochemistry of melanocytes and how the biochemistry of producing melanin, more than melanin itself, if I understood it, protects against bacteria, fungi, etc., etc. This helps explain something that could not be explained by the other view, namely, there are very dark-skinned African peoples who are not out in the sun at all. They are deep in the forest. And you have people on the, let's say, in West Africa. You have people in East Africa who are much more exposed to the sun in Kenya and so on. They're 4,000 feet up, etc. And yet their skin is not so dark. But parasites are a strong factor in the tropical forest. They're a weaker factor at 4,000 feet. They're non-existent as a factor in Norway. Slight exaggeration, okay? So Darwin already knew something that had been, has been forgotten then for 110 years, and now we're rediscovering it out of biochemistry. All right. We don't want to spend all day here, do we? So... Let's, um, let me just say a few comments on behavior and then let's talk about his life. So, and, and you know, we're animal behaviorists except those of us who are just good old residents of Göttingen. Um, he emphasized behavior. He wrote four different books on plant behavior or where behavior was an important part of it. Deceiving insect plants, I've just told you about the, the orchid book. He wrote a book on uh, the use of insects to further outbreeding among plants. He wrote a book on carnivorous plants that are waiting there to grab an insect and eat it. And he wrote a book on climbing plants. And I've watched one in Jamaica in my home and it'll send up a tendril, and the thing is very poorly anchored. It just kind of wanders around in the wind and whatnot. But let it hit something, and ooh, it